the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. The Lovely Look. began quietly, matter-of-factly. Charles Belden would have found it difficult to trace it back to the exact moment when he began to feel as he did toward the girl. Certainly it wasn't love at first sight. Somehow he could still tell himself that he was beyond that sort of thing. That as a respectable married man and the competent manager of the London importing firm, founded by his wife's father, he'd accomplished a certain reputation. But he did remember the first time they met. Some of the words they spoke, the way she looked at him. It was a Sunday morning, cold, unpleasant. The familiar half-fog shrouding the house. He'd gone outside, he didn't know why, to sniff the damp sea air and speculate on the weather. Or perhaps because there was as much companionship in loneliness as in listening to Helen. After nine years, Helen was so very predictable. Near the front gate, the fog parted momentarily drew back like a soft gray curtain, and there she was. She came walking up the road, hesitated as you discovered one another, silently, and then... Hello. Well, hello. I'm I'm sorry, but I've been walking forever, it seems. I wonder if you could direct me... I'm trying to find the Belden residence. Really? And now that you've found it... Have I? I'm Charles Belden. Oh, Mr. Belden. Of course you don't know me. But I came in response to the ad. Ad? In the London Courier. Perhaps Mrs. Belden placed it. Um, regarding a housekeeper. Oh, yes. Um, you didn't write her, talk to her on the telephone. Uh, No. Uh, No, I thought it best to meet her, talk to her in person... I understand you have a problem because of the distance. Quite a problem, yes. Matter of fact, we haven't been able to persuade anyone to stay very long. However, I think think you... Think it best that I talk to Mrs. (laughs) Dell? Yes, that's it. More in her province, you know. Um, Come along, I believe she's back from her morning stroll. (laughs) Daily ritual with her, you know. Here, I'll take your case. Oh, Oh, you're very kind, Mr. Belden. Not at all. It's strange, isn't it, Charles? The effect of that brief moment of silence when you first caught sight of her. And going toward the house, taking her to see your wife, Helen, there's a vague awakening, a stirring of something inside of you that suggests a beginning and the end of monotony. And a few minutes later, you find yourself oddly interested in the outcome of Helen's questioning. The interview with... uh, Laurie Edgley, I read of your need in the courier... I'd rather you had written us, Laurie, or called. Does it matter, Helen? It was thoughtless of me, I know. And I should have thought of references, but if you've no one else in mind, I'd be very happy to to work for you. We haven't, have we, Helen? No. 
However, I'd appreciate a few days' trial, Mrs. Belden. And if you didn't think me efficient... What do you say, Helen? I think Laurie's trying to be fair. Of course, it's up to you. Yes. Very well, we'll try it for a week. Oh, thank you, ma'am. And you, Mr. Belden? Not at all. We've waited some time now. A week can't make much difference. Except that you might not like us. Oh, I don't think that's fair. We'll discuss it later, Laurie. Come along. I'll show you where you'll stay. Yes, ma'am. The way she looks at you. That's it, isn't it, child? Laurie's gentle, lovely look. It lingers in your mind, fading in and out of focus as you think about it and consider its meaning. Somehow it's more than a grateful glance, child. You're certain of it. And it remains with you in the, in the days that follow, in the long drive to London and the dull hours at the office. What have we decided on that shipment of Cloy's name, Mr. Belden? It's being held at the Southampton warehouse, you know. Mr. Belden. Yes, Laurie? What's that, Mr. Belden? Oh, sorry, Jameson. What was it now? The cloisonnier, that shipment. Oh, yes. Why, I see no reason why we shouldn't accept it. Take care of it, will you, Jameson? I'm going home early today. Oh? Feeling badly, Mr. Belden? Not at all. I feel fine. What is it, Helen? Close the door. Charles, that young woman. We've got to get rid of her. Laurie, isn't she satisfactory? Oh, as a housekeeper, she's excellent. Well, then I don't understand. It happened early this afternoon. Oh, Charles, it upset me. So Mrs. Wilton drove up from the village. Oh, that busybody. She came to discuss the elections at the club. You know I'm running for the presidency, and I'm counting on her support to put me... All right, all right. What happened? Well, Laurie didn't answer the door. I finally had to do it myself. Is that all? Helen, the girl simply hasn't caught on to the routine of things. It isn't that I'm trying to tell you. I spoke to her when Mrs. Wilton had gone. Charles, she asked if... if she did everything else to our satisfaction. Would we mind if she didn't answer the door or take telephone calls? What? Exactly my reaction. Naturally, I demanded an explanation. Well, did she give one? It isn't satisfactory. Not to me, Charles. What did she tell you? A wild tale... Something about coming out here to get away from someone. Oh? A man. He's in love with her. She professes to be terrified of him. Says that he's threatened to kill her. And you don't believe her? Believe her? There's more to it than that. The girl's a fugitive, Charles. Something of the sort. I wonder. Wonder? Yes. She seems so... Oh, well, so gentle, Helen. So harmless and gentle. And we've had so much trouble getting anyone to stay. You mean you don't think we should do anything about it? Well, if you insist, I'll talk to her. But you're not at all alarmed about leaving me way out here alone with her. Charles, I'll never understand you. You're careless of me, thoughtless, disinterested in everything. Even my father's company. Helen, please don't speak that. No, you're going to talk to that girl. Charles, dismiss her. Tonight, she just doesn't seem to... Oh... Oh, I'm sorry. It's I... all right, Laurie. Come in. I'm going to bed, Charles. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Belden. Um, Laurie. Yes, Mr. Belden. Laurie, we've just been talking, and um, yes, she, Mrs. Belden, told me how, how well you did your work today, and it's all right, Laurie. I'll get that. You don't have to answer the phones or the front door ever. And you're going to be all right. Right here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Belden. Thank you very much. With the prologue of The Lovely Look, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You know, out here in Hollywood, where The Whistler is produced, an actor or actress often becomes famous for some one feature, such as the legs or the body or the voice, that folks often overlook the fact that they're also very great at acting. Well, it occurred to me that it's much the same with Signal Gasoline. Signal has become so famous as the go-farther gasoline, many folks forget what makes that good mileage possible, the quality in Signal Gasoline. 
You see, the best yardstick of gasoline quality is mileage. After all, the only way any gasoline can give you better mileage is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, smoother power, the kind of performance you expect from a quality gasoline. That's why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, just remember two things. One, in gasoline it takes extra quality to go farther. And two... Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. You couldn't dismiss her, could you, Charles? Couldn't carry out Helen's demands, no. Because everything she'd said, all her complaints, demands, were swept away when Laurie looked at you. Her soft eyes wide and pleading, and somehow you found the strength to stand up for her, and later to stand up to Helen, as you knew you must. You said a week, Helen. Surely you can give the girl that much time. I can't understand why you're so interested in a servant, Charles. She's not exactly a servant. She needs help, I tell you. Something or someone to cling to. And since we need her, why not give her a chance? You managed to convince Helen, didn't you? Temporarily win her over to your way of thinking, and Laurie stays on. But week after week, the contest between you and Helen is renewed. And her patience is reaching the breaking point. But it doesn't seem to matter, does it? Because you know that Laurie understands. And all the time, the strange, unspoken bond between you has increased. As she attends to your every wish, hangs on every word you say. You wonder how long it will go on, where it will lead. Then the answer finally comes in a phone call to your office. Mrs. Belden calling, sir. Go ahead. Yes, Helen? Charles, I want you to drop around to the employment agency sometime today and see about another housekeeper. Another? Helen, what do you mean? What's the matter with Laurie? I, I can't you... stand it any longer. I won't have Laurie around another minute. I've, I've discharged her. What? I'm just not satisfied with this arrangement at all. But, Helen... You... Really, Charles, I don't care to discuss it any further, nor have I the time. I'm due at the club in half an hour. The election, you know. Helen, will you listen to me? It's I... no use, Charles. I've made up my mind. I've told Laurie she can stay just one more week, and that's all. For a moment, you sit there, stunned, and then slowly replace the receiver. And as you sit back, trying to think it out, something Helen has said many times passes through your mind. Helen called her a servant. You know now, you've known for many, many weeks that she's far more than that, isn't she? She's everything to you, Charles. And just as she has tried to tell you with every action, every look, you suddenly feel the urge to tell her. An hour later, you're racing across the English countryside. The rain driving against you as the car swerves perilously along the narrow cliff road. Finally, you swing into the driveway, hurry up the steps into the house. Laurie! Laurie! Then you hear it. The movement in the kitchen. You hurry down the hall and catch sight of Laurie. The thunder drowns your voice. She doesn't hear. You move across the kitchen and touch her arm. Gently. <laughs> Oh, Laurie, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to startle you. Mr. Belden. No, that's quite all right. It was silly of me to. But I always think it, it might be him. I know. What, whatever are you doing home at this hour, Mr. Belden? I didn't expect... Well, I, I left some important papers in my desk. I had to come back from the office. Oh, in this storm, too. What a shame. Oh, here, let me do that. You'll cut yourself. Uh, may I fix some tea for you, Mr. Belden, before I go? Go? You're going out in this weather. Oh, it'll be clearing soon. And this is my day off, you know. Oh, yes, of course. I thought I'd go down to the village. I have some things to buy. Laurie, don't go. What? I mean, 
the village road. It's terribly slippery in the rain. On the way here, my car skidded, almost went over the cliffs. Oh, how awful. You could have been killed. Would you have cared, Laurie? Why, why, of course, Mr. Belden. You, you've been so kind to me. Laurie, listen to me. You can't go away. You mustn't. But Mrs. Belden said... Oh, she's quick-tempered. She says a lot of things she doesn't really mean. And besides, I can't let you go. Well, I suppose I could stay until you got someone else. That isn't what I mean, Laurie. It's... Well, I know I'm handling this rather badly. I, I don't quite know how to say it. You see, I've never really been in love before. In, in love? <sighs> don't you understand? Please. I want to marry you, Laurie. But you are married. Laurie, I'll change all that, and oh, when please, I'm free... Please, Mr. Belden, you mustn't talk that way. I had to let you know how I felt. And now that you do, well, I don't expect an answer right away. I hope you'll want to think about it a little. I think... I think I'd better go now, Mr. Belden. Yes, all right, Laurie. But you will think it over, won't you? You watch Laurie as she hurries out. Somehow you feel confident that she'll want you to find a way. A way to rid yourself of Helen. But that isn't going to be easy. Divorce is out of the question. Helen would certainly oppose it. And even if she didn't, a divorce would leave you penniless. The importing business, the house, everything belongs to Helen. Moments later in the library, you pour yourself a drink, pace the floor, try to find the answer to your problem. You're so engrossed with your thoughts, you don't hear the car in the driveway, the sound of the front door, and you don't feel the eyes watching you from the hallway. And then... Charles. Yes. Oh, Helen, I... I know, I know. You didn't expect me so soon. Well, I thought this was going to be an all-day meeting. It was going to be, yes. I simply walked out on them and came home. Something happened at the club. After all I've done for them. Imagine to elect a silly, illiterate creature like that Mrs. Meglin. I simply don't... Uh, by the way, Charles, what are you doing home at this time of day? Well, I... I... <laughs> really, Charles, I could have saved you this early trip back from town. I should have told you that Laurie always goes to the village on her day off. Didn't you know? What do you mean? I know why you came here, darling. You thought I'd be gone all day. You came back to see Laurie, didn't you? Laurie? Why, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I... Is it? Helen, you can't be serious. Oh, stop I... it, Charles. You take me for a complete fool. I've noticed the way you watched her. Sick, stupid look on your face, mooning about like a schoolboy, really. Helen, you're imagining Indeed, things. I never did it. So I tell you. Amusing, that... Charles. Do you think for one moment she'd be interested in you? Helen, that's enough. You're so terribly dull, darling. So unromantic. Helen! I feel sorry for you. But you'll get over it. Laurie will be gone soon, and you'll go back to your rose garden, your pipe collection, and you'll still have me. Won't you, darling? Charles, where are you going? Charles! As you hurry out of the house to your car, the rage within you gradually subsides. For an instant back there in the library, you thought you could have killed her, and you wonder why you didn't. That would have solved everything. Yes, with Helen dead, you'd be free to marry Laurie. Suddenly, as you drive toward the village, the answer to your problem becomes quite clear. And you find yourself thinking of murder, Helen's murder. And you're still thinking minutes later as you stop in the village and enter the tobacco shop. Morning, Mr. Belden. Good morning, Matthew. Seems like it's clearing up a bit, eh? Quite a storm we had last night. Yes, yes, it was. Um, what's going on over at the constable's office? I noticed quite a few people. Oh, that bit of excitement we had. Constable and some of the lads brought a man down from the cliffs. No, oh, the cliffs. Tourist chap. Staying over at the inn. Decided he'd take a bit of a stroll early this morning. Lost his footing. Good thing for him he wasn't killed. I see. Uh, what'll it be, Mr. Belden? Mm, same as usual, Matthew. Small tin. Right, oh. Uh, ah, lucky chap, that one. Dropped some 15, 20 feet down to a ledge he did. Only thing stopped him from going all the way. Bruised him up a bit, hurt his leg, about all. Uh, he was lucky, all right. <sighs> There you are, Mr. Belden. Thank you. It might be wise to caution Mrs. Belden about what happened this morning. She still goes for her walk along the cliffs every morning, doesn't she? Oh, yes. 
Yes, she does. Yeah, the cliffs are dangerous in this kind of weather. Yes, you're quite right. Never can tell what might happen, you know. No, you never can tell. <laughs> That's it, isn't it, Charles? An accident on the cliffs, and you'll be free. The villagers all know of Helen's daily walks along the cliffs. Know how dangerous the cliffs can be during the rainy season. It's perfect, isn't it? Yes. And you have the rest of the day to think it over, to make your plans. Late that evening, when you return to the house, Helen is already retired, and you hurry to find Laurie. You've got to know what her answer is before you make your next move. You can't wait, can you? You want to get it over with as quickly as possible. As you step into the half-darkened library, you see Laurie standing by the window, staring out into the garden, her back toward you. You approach within a few feet of her. Laurie, don't turn round. Don't say anything. Just listen to me. I've found a way. A way to be free of Helen. But first, I've got to know how you feel. I've got to know if you want me to go ahead with it. Now, listen, Laurie. This is very important. You'll not be implicated. You don't have to answer me. You don't have to say a thing, Laurie, unless... unless you want to stop me. Shall... shall I go ahead with it? All right, darling. I'll do it. <laughs> Morning, my dear. My, you're up bright and early. Rather a surprise. We haven't had breakfast together in ages. Mm, yes, I, I wanted to catch you before you left the house. You are going for a walk this morning? Well, I thought I would. The rain has stopped. But uh, why'd you ask? Helen, I... Well, it might sound odd to you. Helen, early in our marriage, we used to go for walks together. It, it seemed to me that we were able to talk out so many things. That's true, Charles, but... I was wondering... Couldn't I walk along with you now, this morning? Why, why, of course, Charles. But what about the office? Don't you have... Oh, it can wait, Helen. We're more important. Yes. Yes, we are. Charles, I'd enjoy having you go with me. We'll walk along the cliffs, like we did before. I'll get my coat. And, Charles... Yes? I'm glad you thought of this. Good. I think it'll settle a lot of things, Helen, for both of us. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since this coming Thursday is Thanksgiving Day, I want to say for Signal Oil Company and the almost 2,000 Signal dealers who serve the six Pacific Coast states from Canada to Mexico, we hope that your Thanksgiving will be filled to overflowing, not only with good food, but also with good health and good cheer. Certainly all of us can be thankful from the bottom of our hearts that we're living in America, the land of abundance and freedom for all. We of the Signal Oil Company like to feel that in our 17 years of serving the West, we have played a part in furthering the way of life that is America. Because Signal dealers are in business for themselves, they are carrying on the tradition of the independent businessman who has played such an important role in building America. And Signal Oil Company, by supplying its dealers with constantly finer products, is helping them keep ahead of that ever-present healthy competition, which is the key to America's continuing progress. Competition which helps all of us here in America enjoy the highest in the world standard of living. And now back to the whistler. It's all over now, isn't it, Charles? The walk you took along the cliffs with Helen was the last one you'll ever have to take with her. And as you turn away from the precipice, the fog moves in around you, and you hurry back along the path toward the house. You're anxious to see Laurie again, talk to her, gain the reassurance that sweeps over you every time she looks at you. There's magic in those moments, isn't there, Charles? An enchantment and beauty that cannot be denied. And after the weeks of waiting, you've settled it finally. 
And Lori need never leave the house that will now be yours. Lori! Lori! Oh, there you are. Oh. Oh, is, is something wrong? No, Lori. It's over. Exactly as I said. Over? It'll seem like an accident, Lori. I'm sure of it. it. It's happened to someone from the hotel in the village. They'll think it was the same with Helen. Your, your wife? Don't you understand, Laurie? Helen's dead. If they come round, just tell them we missed her this morning. Thought she'd gone for a walk. Uh, you... You've killed her. Laurie. No. No, no, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Laurie. She turns, hurries away. You take a few steps after her, then stop. It's the shock, isn't it, Charles? You can feel it yourself now. The realization of what you've done. But you'll be all right, and so will Laurie. You wonder if you should go on to the office, give her time to think. And then suddenly you hear the sound of Helen's car from the drive and rush to the window. Laurie, driving toward the village. Good Lord. Racing after her in your own car, a dozen thoughts pound in your mind as you wonder what you've done wrong. Perhaps it was the way you told her the suddenness of it, the cold shock. And then you see Helen's car parked at the curb. You stop, step out, and realize too late that you followed Laurie right to the constable's office, where he's talking to her. And then, as you turn to hurry away... Just a moment, Belden. Huh? I wouldn't try to get back in that car if I were you. What? What's the matter, constable? I have a few questions to ask you. Laurie here tells me you've killed your wife. She told you? Yes, just now. But she was in on it herself. She knew I was going to do it. I, I told her and she didn't stop me. No, 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 that's not true. But, Laurie, last night in the library, you were standing by the window, looking out into the garden. The I... library? Last night? Why, I... I didn't even see you. But you heard me, Laurie. You must have. Just a moment, Belden. If Laurie says she didn't see you, she couldn't have heard you. What? Don't you understand? That's why I couldn't answer the doorbell, the telephone. That's why I made up that story of the man who was supposed to be threatening me. Belden, haven't you ever noticed the way Laurie looks at you? Yes. A lovely look. She has a good reason for that look. You see, Laurie can't hear. When she looks at you like that, she's reading your lips. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were John Hoyt, Lorette Philbrandt, and Mary Lansing. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed tonight by Sterling Tracy, with story by Mary Ruth Funk and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.